giving all praises to the Heavenly Father, Yahweh, Barashem, Yahweh Shai, Barashem, Kodash. Shalom to the Lord's elect. Once again, it's another video. And this video will be on the history side of things. I'm going to call this video from Jesus Christos to Serapis Christus to Jesus Christ. From Jesus Christos to Serapis Christus to Jesus Christ. And of course, I'm talking about the Jesus Christ that many people worship that actually think that that's the only begotten Son of the Heavenly Father, you know, complete with the image. And once again, it shows what Yahweh Shai said to that woman at the well when he made the statement to her. And that applies to, to a lot of these wacky tacky Christians, which they worship but they have no idea what they are worshiping and the origin of what they are worshiping as in Jesus Christ. Um, this is the book of John, the fourth chapter and the 23rd verse. I'll start at the 22nd verse because that begins the point. It says, ye worship, ye know not what. These were the words Yahweh Shai was speaking to this woman at the well, which this woman at the well was a heathen. All right, she was one of the converts that was brought in the land of Samaria by Shalmanazar the king. Okay, she was one of the descendants of the converts. Okay, that's what I meant to say. She's, she was one of the descendants of the converts because the converts that were brought in the land of Samaria that goes back to 722 BC underneath Shalmanazar the king of Assyria at that time. So what you had was hundreds of years of descendants living in that land and after a while claiming that that was their land, okay? And um, this woman at the well who Yahweh Shah was talking to, she was a descendant of those converts that were brought in, okay? The scripture clearly tells you that the people that originated in that land, as in the tribe of Ephraim, that lived, lived in the land of Samaria, they were taken out of there by the Assyrian king, okay, Shalmanazar, and carried into captivity into the land of Assyria. And converts were brought in to replace them in that land. So that's why Yahweh Shai made a statement to that woman. He said, you worship, you know not what. As a matter of fact, let's keep reading. Ye worship, ye know not what. We... So he put a distinction there. What nationality was Yahweh Shai? He was a Hebrew Israelite of the tribe of Judah. So he said, we, as in us Israelites, all right, we know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. Really, that should say salvation is of the Israelites. The Jews represented the southern kingdom of the nation of Israel, consisted of Judah, Benjamin, and Levi, which were the predominant tribes at that time, okay? They were the pre predominant tribes that were around at that time. You had a scattering, a very small scattering of the northern kingdom, but the predominant tribes were, that were there at that time was Judah, Benjamin, and Levi, collectively called Jews. Okay? So Yahweh Shai told this woman, look, we know what we're worshiping, all right? For salvation is of the Jews. Salvation is of the Israelites, as in the southern kingdom, because they were the predominant tribes that was back there at that time. All right, and now what we're living in a time where the Heavenly Father Yahweh, through His only begotten Son Yahweh Shai, is joining back the nation of Israel, all 12 tribes. All right, starting with the elect, starting with the elect of the 12 tribes of Israel. They're being gathered together through, through this knowledge, and according to Bible prophecy, they're going to be delivered. Because when Yahweh Shai comes, Matthew 24 and 30, He's going to deliver His elect of the nation of Israel. And with the elect, the Heavenly Father is going to repopulate the nation, rebuild the nation, the nation of Israel, all 12 tribes. And we're going to go back to the land of Israel and inhabit that land, according to Bible prophecy. One scripture that comes to mind is the book of Isaiah, the 14th chapter. All right. As a matter of fact, let's go to that real quick. Isaiah 14 and 1. Let's read it. It says, For the Lord will have mercy on Jacob 
Jacob's name was changed to Israel, and will yet choose Israel and set them in their own land. So we're going back to the land of Israel. After the land of Israel is, is uh, pretty much cleansed by fire, and that would be the nuclear missiles and the chariots of the Lord, we're going to go back to that land of Israel after the land is cleansed by fire. Okay, the elect of the nation of Israel. Yahweh Shah is going to bring them back to the land of Israel. Because the majority of the elect of the nation of Israel is going to be gathered here in America, also known as Babylon the Great. Now, it, it does say, the prophecy does say that the elect shall be gathered from the four corners of the earth. But the majority of the elect is right here in America, Babylon the Great. And eventually they're going to be brought back to the land of Israel after the war, after World War III after the total destruction of the Edomite kingdom, which is going to be brought on by Yahweh Shai. As a matter of fact, you go into prophecy in Isaiah 63 and 1, it says, Who is this that cometh from Edom with dyed garments from Bozra? That's a dark saying of Yahweh Shai coming to this kingdom and destroying it, okay? And taking down the power of the Edomites, okay? And then setting up his kingdom, which by default is the kingdom of Israel on the planet Earth, and then eventually taking his elect, pursuant to Matthew 24 and 30, and bringing them back to the land of Israel. And this is, this is where Isaiah 14 and 1 comes in. For the Lord will have mercy on Jacob, and will yet choose Israel, and set them in their own land. See that? And the strangers shall be joined with them. Those are the other Israelites. Okay, the other Israelite foreigners. And they shall cleave to the house of Jacob. Right. All twelve tribes. All twelve tribes. The northern kingdom and the southern kingdom are going to be brought back together. Okay, as one nation. Okay, as one nation. So, and that would be the nation of Israel. So, going back to John, the fourth chapter, you worship, you know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. Now, we don't worship Jesus Christ. And by the time you're done seeing this video, you might consider, uh, those of you, especially those of you that are new to this, have I been worshiping a false god? And the answer is yes, Jesus Christ is a false God. And I'm going to show you some of the history of the origin of Jesus Christ, where it goes back to. Okay, we worship Yahweh Shai. There's a big difference between Yahweh Shai and Jesus Christ. Even when you do a simple Google, okay, a simple Google experiment, if I type in Jesus Christ, all right, here we go, Jesus Christ, and I go to the images, this is what you're going to see. You see that? Okay, now is this true according to the scriptures? Is this true according to the Bible? No. All right, this is false according to the Holy Scriptures. All right, now if I type in Yahawashai, which is his true name according to the ancient Hebrew, and the name Yahawashai is even in the Blue Letter Bible, it's written in the ancient Hebrew, Yahawashai, Yahawashai. Okay, so if I type in Yahawashai, which is his true name, there you go. This is more like it, okay? This is more according to the image that the Apostle John saw on the island, the island of Patmos when he described the Lord, all right? Woolly hair, dark skin, okay? This is more uh, closer to the, uh, the image of what Apostle John saw on the island of Patmos than the other image. Now, the other image goes by the, by the title Jesus Christ. This image here is the true image of what Yahawashai would look like. And this is the image, or rather, this is the uh, individual that we worship, okay? Now, all of these il illustrations here, we're not saying that that's exactly Yahawashai, okay? But it's a lot more closer to the, to the description that the Apostle John gave on the island of Patmos when he saw Yahawashai. These, these images that you're looking at here is a lot more closer, okay? Like this image here, okay? Whole, a whole lot more closer, okay, this image here, all right? So uh, the God that we worship, or, the, or rather the Son of God that we worship would look more like this, okay? And then the Father, because Yahweh told Philip, if we go in the book of John, the 14th chapter, John, the 14th chapter, here's another clue, because Yahweh Philip, being one of Yahweh Shai's disciples, asked Yahweh Shai, what does your father look like? Okay? And this was the reply that um, 
Yahweh Shai gave Philip. Okay? Philip, being one of the twelve, saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father. Because Yahweh Shai kept talking about the Heavenly Father. His Father as in Yahweh, the Heavenly Father. Because he had a biological father too. His biological father was Joseph. His biological mother was Mary. But Yahweh Shai always talked about his Heavenly Father. Okay? So Philip asked Yahweh Shai, well, what does the he your heavenly father look like? Let's read it. Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the father, and it sufficeth us. Yahweh Shai saith unto him, have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me? Right, because Philip was part of the ministry of Yahweh Shai. They, they spent three years um, in that ministry. Okay, it was a three-year ministry. All right, so reading on, it says, Philip, he that have seen me have seen the Father. In other words, he was telling Philip, I look like my father. So if Yahweh Shai looked like a dark-skinned man with white woolly hair, gray woolly hair, which is akin to a so-called Negro, so-called black man, that's what the Heavenly Father looks like. The Heavenly Father himself looks like a so-called black man, okay? And his name, his true name is Yahweh. Okay, it says, he that hath seen me hath seen the Father, and how sayest thou then, show us the Father. Right, so if you saw the Son of the Heavenly Father, he was made in the image of the Father. Now, what, what was his look? His look was that of a so-called black man, white woolly hair, dark skin, very dark skin. Okay, so that's akin to a so-called Negro, so-called black man, all right? So, you have to know what you're worshiping, all right? Now, on the, con on the contrary, in contrast, Jesus Christ is that of an image of a so-called white man. Okay, when we go back to the origin of Jesus Christ who set it up, before that image that is now known across the world as Jesus Christ, before it adorned the title of Jesus Christ, the title it had, which you're about to see in this in information, the title that it had was Iesus Christos, also known as Serapis Christus, okay? And that's what the majority of the world, that's the image that they worship, okay? Jesus Christ. So again, going back to John, the fourth chapter, you worship, you know not what. We know what we worship, the salvations of the Jews. Then it goes on to say, but the hour cometh, in, in other words, now is the time, and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Now, is Jesus Christ, is Jesus Christ the truth? The answer is no. All right? The answer is no. And I will show you why I say this. Okay? I'll show you why I say the answer is no. Number one, his name was not Jesus Christ. Okay? When the angel Gabriel was sent to Joseph and Mary, the angel Gabriel spoke Hebrew and Joseph and Mary spoke Hebrew. So, ipso facto, which is Latin for by the fact itself, the angel Gabriel would have gave Joseph and Mary a Hebrew name to name their first son. And Jesus Christ is not a Hebrew. Second, uh, um, second uh, uh, point to be made, okay? That was the first point. The name would have, was given to Joseph and Mary in the Hebrew from the angel Gabriel. Second point is the letter J, which forms Jesus, did, was not the letter J didn't come about until 1524 by John Giorgio Trissino. Now all of these facts you can research yourself. 1524 AD. All right, that's more than uh, 1500 years after the death. Well, well, about 1500 years, maybe about a little more than 1400 years after the death and resurrection of our Lord. The letter J didn't come about till then. So it's impossible for his name to be Jesus. Furthermore, here's a third point. Jesus Christ goes back to Iesus Christos. Iesus Christos was Greek. Now our Lord, it tells you in Hebrews, the seventh chapter. Let's go there. So these are the facts that you have to know concerning the only begotten Son of the Lord, to worship him correctly. All right? Hebrews, the seventh chapter, the 14th verse. Let's read that. It says, for it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah. Now, if you know the history, the tribe of Judah predominant, 
predominantly at that time spoke Hebrew. They spoke the Hebrew language. Our Lord himself spoke Hebrew, okay? So he, our Lord was not Greek. His nationality was not Greek. He was a Hebrew Israelite of the tribe of Judah, okay? So Jesus Christ is a Greek title. Jesus Christ is a Greek title. And actually, the, the actual title is Jesus Christos. It was later, way later that, that it became Jesus Christ, that title. Complete with the image of a so-called white man, which goes back to Serapis Christus, which goes back to a phony god that Ptolemy the first created. And we're going to see that in the information I got. Okay? So let's not move too far ahead of ourselves. Let's go back to John the fourth chapter. But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. And that's the elect. Now all the information I'm going to present in this lesson, the elect would have, would have an understanding of it. And, and would understand that Jesus Christ is not something the true worshipers would worship. As in the elect. Okay? Uh, the true, when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship Him. So we got to know, we got to know the truth concerning Jesus Christ. And is it, is that the right spirit to worship Jesus Christ? Is that the is that the right spirit? Is that the truth? The answer is no, no on both accounts, as we're going to explore in this video. The heavenly Father Yahweh is a spirit, and so is His only begotten Son. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So what is the truth concerning Jesus Christ? Well, let's go to this article that I have here. Okay, now this is an article I've had for a little bit. I just never, the spirit never really hit me to do a video on it. But now the spirit is hitting me to do a video on it. So hopefully you find it edifying. All right, this is from Challenge, Challenging Thoughts. The title is How Jesus Was Invented by the Council of Nicaea in 325 A.D. Now, keep in mind, we do not worship Jesus Christ. We worship Yahweh Shai. That's who we worship. We worship Yahweh and Yahweh Shai. We do not worship no Jesus Christ. His name was not Jesus Christ. Again, the importance of knowing the name of the Heavenly Father and His only begotten Son cannot be overstated. Okay? This is Proverbs, the 30th chapter, and the fourth verse. It says, Who have ascended up into heaven or descended? Who have gathered the wind in his fists? Who have bound the waters in a garment? Who have established all the ends of the earth? What is his name? And what is his son's name, if thou canst tell? See? So we're in a time where the Heavenly Father and his only begotten Son, they are revealing their names. The Heavenly Father through the Holy Spirit, of course, first. Corinthians 2 and 10. Everything we get is through the Holy Spirit. So the names of the Heavenly Father and His only begotten Son, as in the Heavenly Father's name being Yahweh and the Son's name being Yahweh Shai, that was revealed to our elders, which our elders revealed it to us. Okay? And it was revealed through the Spirit. We know that the Heavenly Father's name is Yahweh. We know that His only begotten Son's name is Yahweh Shai. And those are the entities that we worship. We don't worship no God in Jesus Christ. Like, cert, like a certain Israelite group pushes, all right, God and Jesus Christ. We don't worship that nonsense, okay? So now let's, let's read a little bit of this history here. Again, this is from Challenging Thoughts, dated December 13th, 2022. There's Jesus Christ in his, in, in his, in his uh, reprobate glory, <laughs> okay? And, you know, when you look at this image, there's a movie called Agora, right? And you can reference this scene. The movie Agora is about the worship. Basically, it's about the worship of Serapis Christus in the temple called Serapium. And how you had this one bishop that was against that image and seeking to destroy it. Okay? So, this image that you see in here, which the average person would tell you, that, well, that's Jesus Christ. This was the same image that was in the Serapium. Okay, the way that they hooked it up in the Serapium, and this is going back to the history. If you read the history, the way they hooked it up in that temple called the Serapium was almost like this, with the arms spread out. And it, the image was, it was a giant image in that temple. And again, that's referenced in the movie Agora. 
It was a giant image in that temple and it seemed to be levitating in the air. The way that they hooked it up, there was a certain way they hooked it up inside the temple. The giant image that looked just like that, minus the, the, the Modius that was on, it, on the image's head, also known as a, a flower pot, <laughs> that was, which represented the god of agriculture, all right? the, which goes back to Egypt, by the way, because when Ptolemy the first created it, he took it back to the philosophy of Egypt. Hence the title Serapis Christus. The title Serapis was a combination of two Egyptian gods, fake gods, Osiris and Apis the bull. Both fake gods that the Israelites worship. Okay? Because we why do I say fake God? Because in Deuteronomy the sixth chapter, the fourth verse, it tells you us Israelites, we only have one God. Let's get it. Okay? There's only one God. Alright? And that is the truth. Okay? Hebrews, the sixth chapter, and the fourth verse. Hear, O Israel, which of all the nations, what nation is the closest to the Heavenly Father? The nation of Israel. Let's go to 2 Samuel 7 and 24. Let's prove that. 2 Samuel 7 and 24. Well, let me start at 23. And what one nation in the earth is like thy people, even like Israel? See that? Whom the Heavenly Father went to redeem for people to himself and to make him a name and to do. And how, uh, Did he not make his name when he destroyed Pharaoh and his army in the Red Sea? Of course he did. He magnified his name. And, who, and for what nation did he do that great work for? For the nation of Israel. Okay? So that's, that's an example of the part where it says here, and to make him a name. And to do for you great things and terrible. Again, that was a great thing and a terrible thing at the same time. Okay, when the Israelites walked through the Red Sea, all right, the, north, the most northern part of the Gulf of Suez, they walked right through it. And then following them hard was the Egyptians. The Israelites were able to get on the other side while the Egyptians was barred, right? They were, they were blocked by the force of the Heavenly Father. Okay, they were blocked. And when, when that... Uh, when that uh, the thing that hindered them was moved out of the way, the waters opened up and drowned all the Egyptians, okay, as in Pharaoh and his army, okay? Those were the Egyptians that was in the water, all right? It was Pharaoh and his army, and every last one of them drowned when the waters closed back, okay? Because the Lord had created a path for the Israelites to walk through, walk through that, that body of water, but then when the Egyptians that was pursuing them when they were finally allowed to pursue them, right, the Israelites had gotten on the other side, the waters came together and drowned every last one of them. And drowning is a very horrific way to die, okay? So this is what is meant by, and to make him a name, because at, after that incident, the Heavenly Father's name, Yahweh, was magnified. All the nations knew about the Heavenly Father and his name, Yahweh, because that one action served to magnify his name. Okay, and to make him a name and to do for you great things and terrible for thy land before thy people, which thou redeemest to thee from Egypt, from the nations and their gods. See that? Like Apis the bull, uh, Osiris. Okay, and that's what Ptolemy did. He combined the two, two Egyptians, so called Egyptian gods, and created this Serapis. Christus, okay, and he put a Greek face to it, hence the reason why the image looks like a so-called white man, which represented the Greeks, which the Greeks were Edomites, okay, and today we have your so-called white man Jesus, Jesus Christ, okay, it says, for thou hast confirmed to thyself thy people Israel to be a people unto thee forever, and thou, Lord, art become their power, their God, not God's, their God. So we only have, what's the point? We only have one power that we worship. So this when we go back to Deuteronomy 6 and 4, Hail O Israel, the Lord, our, our power is one Lord. So we only worship one power and the mediator to that power, which is Yahweh Shai. Okay? So, again, going back to the information, right? So, and, and you'll notice, right, 
uh, here's another point which lets you know that this is a fake image that 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 need not be worshipped. All right, it's a fake image because, or it's a fake god because at the border of the garment that this image is wearing, where's where's the ribband of blue? Where's the fringes? Our power told us in all our garments. Matter of fact, let's go to the law. So that image is that image doesn't live up to the law. That image right there. When we go in the book of Numbers 15, and I've been looking at a lot of these different images of so-called Jesus Christ, and not one of those images with, with that that's wearing the, the the toga. I call it a toga, a Greek toga. Not one of those images have a border of blue and fringes at the bottom. So check that out. Okay, Numbers 15. When that's a law. Numbers 15 and 37, let's read it. It says, it says, uh, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel. Again, the, the uh, Son of the Heavenly Father, which we do worship, and he's worthy of being worshipped. He is our mediator to the Heavenly Father, Yahweh. He was an Israelite. So this law that I'm about to read applied to him as well. Because he was a, a, a Hebrew Israelite of the tribe of Judah. Right? So it says, speak unto the children of Israel. He was, he was of, the, of the nation of Israel. And the children, the word children in the Hebrew is sons. He was one of the sons of Israel. As a matter of fact, he was the top son of Israel. Right? The top son of Israel. Yahweh Shai. Right? Speak unto the children of Israel and bid them that they make fringes in the borders of their garments. So if the top son of Israel is going to wear a garment, you best believe there's going to be a border of blue and fringes on those garments. How come we don't see that here? Where's the border of blue? Okay. Where's the border of blue? And where's the fringes? It doesn't exist. You know why? Because this is a fake God. Okay. This so-called God is not according to the scriptures. All right. It's a figment of Ptolemy the First's imagination. That's really what it is. Okay. Numbers 15 and 38, speak unto the children of Israel and bid them that they make them fringes in the borders of their garments. This is a law throughout their generations. See that? And that they put upon the fringe of the borders of the garment a ribband of blue. Okay? And it shall be unto you for fringe that you may look upon it. Right, the fringes are supposed to represent the laws, statutes, and commandments of the Heavenly Father, which there are over 600 of them. So that was one of the law, or laws, that when we wear our garments, we're supposed to have a border of blue and fringes at the bottom. You don't see that here. So is this, is this truth? Is this so-called God here? Is this the truth? The answer is no. Okay? The answer is no. Okay? No border of blue, no fringes. This, this, this thing fails. Okay? Numbers 15 and 39. And it shall be unto you for a fringe, and that you may look upon it, and remember all the commandments of the Lord. See that? And do them. And that ye seek not after your own heart, and your own, heart, your own eyes, after which you used to go a whoring. And many of our people went a whoring after this image. When Ptolemy first introduced it back in the land of Egypt around 280, somewhere around 280, 282 BC. These are facts, okay, as we're going to learn. So now let's get into the information here. So the Council of Nicaea, right, which I believe came on the scene around 325 AD. Okay, let's read about that. The Council of Nicaea. This is the council where the character of Jesus Christ was created. Many might argue that the council's one purpose was to determine the biblical canon. As it turns out, there is no evidence of the council being behind the biblical canon. Okay? Ptolemy I, also known as Me Yamun Sep uh, Se Sete Penre, Sete Penre or Penra, have you said, uh, circa 367 to 283 BCE, 
All right. Some say that's the before common era. Some say it before Christ era. All right. Um, reading on, it says, aka soda. Soda means savior. So that was Ptolemy the first title. His his title was Ptolemy the first soda. Okay. Because he announced himself as the savior of Egypt. He even said he was going to bring back the old Egyptian priesthood. But he, what he did was he, he took bits and pieces of it, the old Egyptian priesthood, and the so-called gods that they worship, as in Osiris and Apis the bull, hence the title of Serapis, and he put a Greek face to it. That's all he did. Okay? He took the the certain tenets of the old Egyptian priesthood, all right, and he put a Greek face to it. He even wore the uh, old Egyptian priest garments that the priests used to wear when they conducted uh, their uh, witchcraft uh, ceremonies. All right, Ptolemy the first even did that. These are facts, okay? So reading on, it says, became the first European white pharaoh of Egypt through military force. And I wouldn't even use the word European because the true Europeans were dark skinned. I would use the word Edom, the Edomite. That's what I would say. The first Edomite pharaoh of Egypt. Because before that, the line of the pharaohs were so-called Egyptians, which were so-called black people. Okay, so-called black people as people of color. All right? People of color. Because the Hamites were what? People of color. The Egyptians goes back to Ham. The Hamites were people of color. All right? The Ishmaelites were people of color. All right? The East Indians, the Elamites were people of color. The so-called white man is the only oddball on the planet Earth, okay? That, those are facts. Now, we do have Israelites scattered among the so-called white people, so we don't get down on all of them. Because we know that our seed is mingled among them. Okay? So reading on, it says, became the first European, which the first Edomite, let's place the word that should be there, the first Edomite pharaoh of Egypt. Prior before that, the pharaohs of Egypt were Hamitic. The pharaohs of Egypt were Hamitic. Not Shemitic, Hamitic. Okay? Which we, as the true Israelites, were Shemitic. Alright? There's a big difference between the Hamites, all right, and the seed of Shem, okay, the Shemites, uh, became the first so-called white pharaoh of Egypt through military force led by Alexander the Greek, absolutely, a.k.a. Alexander the Great. When Ptolemy became pharaoh of Egypt, he wanted the Egyptians to worship him as a god, absolutely. Okay, and that's always been the desire of the Edomites to be seen as God. Let, hold up, let's bring in the scripture here. Okay, let's bring in the book of Second, and it was no different with Ptolemy when Ptolemy, t Ptolemy took over Egypt. Okay, uh, Second Thessalonians, the second chapter, and the third verse Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. And that man of sin be revealed as the Edomites, the son of perdition, they're being exposed now, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God. He even did that among the Egyptians. He announced himself as their new gods, and that they should bow down and worship him. Right? Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worship, right? So that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, Showing himself that he is a god. Again, a great example of that would be the Serapium, which was erected in Egypt. Alexandria, the city of Alexandria, Alexandria to be exact. And the image that was in there was what? The image of a so-called white man being worshipped. You had people that came from afar and came to that temple and worshipped that fake god, Serapis Christus, as a so-called white man. With the arms stretched out. And the image, the giant image that seemed to be levitating in the air like it was flying. That's according to the history. Okay? So that, that, that scripture right there nails it. So that he as God sitteth in the temple of God showing himself that he is a God. Or he is God. But when Yahweh comes, he's going to show that this so-called white man is not a God. 
He's even lower than a lower than a man. He's the as it is written. He's the they are the basis of all men, as it is written. When Ptolemy became Pharaoh of Egypt, which I believe the word Pharaoh para, I believe it is, which means the sun. The pharaohs considered themselves gods, but the pharaohs before Ptolemy the first, they were Hamitic. They were people of color. So when Ptolemy the first became Pharaoh or took on the title of Pharaoh, that's the beginning of an Edomite sitting up or sitting up there in a Hamitic throne and calling himself God. You see that? And that lines in right with the scripture, 2 Thessalonians. Okay? So reading on, and not only did they do that to the Egyptians, they did that to us as well. Had many Israelites worshiping uh, Esau as God or an image of Esau as God, as in Serapis Christus. There were many Israelites that were living in Egypt at that time. You have something called the Alexandrian Jews. The Alexandrian Jews were Israelites, particularly from the southern kingdom, Judites, Judah, Benjamin, Levi, that lived in Egypt that were being called Alexandrian Jews after the city known as Alexandria, named after Alexander the Greek or Alexander the Great. Okay? So, reading on, it says, he wanted the Egyptians to worship him as a god. He wanted to be called a god because that was the title that was used to be assigned to all the pharaohs of Egypt prior to him. Right, which they were Hamitic. They were Hamitic. They looked like the, the people of Ham. Because that, that land known as Africa, back in the past, it wasn't called Africa. It was called the land of Ham. Let's go to Psalms 105 and 23, I believe it is, to show you evidence of that. Okay, the land of Ham. Let's go to the book of Psalms 105. So we're going down the um, uh, history lane, all right? Psalm 105 and 23, is it? Let's see. Israel also came into Egypt. And Jacob sojourned in the land of Ham. So before it was called Africa, long before it was called Africa, which was named after a Roman general, an Edomite general, named Leo Scipio Africanus. Now, if we go in the book of Psalm 49 and 11, one thing that the Edomites did after they conquered the land, they put their names on that land. Case in point, America. America, the name America goes back to Amadigo Vespucci. And that name was placed on this land, which at that, before that, the land was, this land was known as the fourth part of the world or the ends of the world. So before it received the term America, which goes back to Amadigo Vespucci, that's what, what it was known as, this land. It was known as either the fourth part of the world or the ends of the world. All right, so Psalm 49 and 11, let's read that. Their inward thought is that their houses shall continue forever. It's talking about the Edomites. And their dwelling places to all generations, all the lands that they have conquered. See, the land that belonged to the Edomites was the land of Edom. That was, the, that was their portion. It tells you that in the book of Deuteronomy. The Heavenly Father assigned each nation to their portion. Okay, uh, let's go to De Deuteronomy 32. So the Edomites, what they did, being the wicked, this is and this is a clear-cut sign that they're the wicked. What they did was they went to other na other lands and conquered those lands, because they get they got the blessing of the sword. Go back to Genesis 27 and 40, they got the blessing of the sword. So with that blessing, they went conquering other lands, other nations, and taking their land, and declaring their land to be the the land that they own. Okay, and America is no different. Deuteronomy 32 and uh, what is it? 8. When the Most High divided to the nations their inheritance, as in their land, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the children according to the number of the children of Israel. Why is that? For the Lord's portion is his people, those are the Israelites. Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. So the point is, when he divided to the nations their land. So the Edomites, they had their own land. Which, which was south of the land of uh, Judah, but they were, their land was a hilly, rocky terrain, a desolate land. The land that the Heavenly Father gave them, the Edomites, was a desolate land because they were created to be, uh, they were created, the Edomites were created to be the wicked of the Heavenly Father. 
the, the people that were known as the wicked created by the Heavenly Father. They were also created to be hated by the Heavenly Father. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. That's why of all the nations, they got the worst land. Their land was nothing but a hilly, rocky terrain. Okay? So, going back to Psalms 49 11, the inward thought is that their houses shall continue forever. All the lands they don't stole, the Edomites, and their dwelling places to all generations. Right, the lands that they stole. They call their lands after their own names, after they have stolen them and conquered the people. They place their own names on the land. Okay, like I said, Africa, America are two great examples. Okay, so now let's go back to the information. When Ptolemy became Pharaoh of Egypt, he wanted the Egyptians to worship him as a god. He wanted to be called a god because that was the title that was assigned to all the pharaohs of Egypt. And I do believe the word pharaoh is from the Hebrew, I think it is, para, which means the sun. Now, I could be mistaken on that. Someone can correct me in the comments section. Uh, to all the pharaohs of Egypt prior to him. Right. However, the black people of Egypt, now there were Hamites there. There were Hamites, but do you also had Israelites. The Israelites were dark-skinned dark people too. So you had side by side in Egypt at that time. You had Hamites living there, the real Egyptians, right? They were living there, and then later they got pushed out of there. The the real Egyptians and Elder Pasta always goes into that. They were the Sudan, Sudanese people, the Watusi, and, and and tribes like that. They were the ancient. The Egyptians were known for their height, and they were they were very ugly, extremely ugly people but they were known for their height. So many of them got pushed out of Egypt and pushed further south, down to South Africa. All right, so that's why you got those tribes down there. They're the ancient Egyptians that the Bible talks about. Now, they, at that time, during the time of Pharaoh, um, not Pharaoh, I'm sorry, during the time of Ptolemy, they were living side by side with the Israelites. Okay, they were living side by side with the Israelites. And when the Edomites got up in there, they started conquering both Israelites and Hamites. Okay? So, uh, and the Greeks pretty much conquered the whole known world at that time because the Heavenly Father was with them to fulfill prophecy. That's why they conquered. He wanted to be called a god because that was the title that was used to assign to all the pharaohs of Egypt prior to him. However, the black people of Egypt refused to call him a god because they knew that that the only reason he became pharaoh was through force right he didn't become see back then among the the uh, egyptians among their 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 thing he, he, that was a divine right you received from from their their um, their perception of the creator okay that's going to, back to their thing the egyptians you know and and, and their their so-called religion their philosophy so when this guy told me the first announced himself as God, they weren't having it, all right? But he had the power. He took the Egyptian priesthood, the Hermetic Egyptian priesthood, he took it by force, okay? Does that sound like an Edomite? Absolutely, <laughs> that's what they do. However, the black people of Egypt refused to call him a God because they knew that the only reason he became Pharaoh was through force. So in 305 BC, Ptolemy took the title of Pharaoh, absolutely. Taking the Egyptian name, and that's why they'll tell you, oh, the, the Pharaohs were so-called white people. They, they, yeah, they became, the Pharaohs became so-called white people when Ptolemy the first stepped in there. But prior before that, you had a long line of Pharaohs. Going all the way back to Moses. Moses dealt with a Pharaoh. The, the Pharaohs during the time of Moses, they didn't look like so-called white people. They looked like so-called black people. They were, they were people of color. Like I said, the Hamites are people of color, different nation than us, but nevertheless, they're people of color. Okay, so Ptolemy took the title of Pharaoh, taking the Egyptian name Mayamun, Mayamun Setepenre, or Setepenra, right? Which means beloved of Amun. Amun means God, okay? Chosen of Ra, Ra means God. Now, in the Hebrew, Ra or Ra means evil. Okay, so reading on the refusal of ancient black Egyptians, Egyptians to acknowledge Ptolemy as a god, 
He began killing the black people of Egypt. Well, that sounds familiar. That's what the Edomites do. Which caused the black Egyptian priests at Memphis to approve his request of being worshipped as a god in order to save their own lives. So they, they bowed down to the, to the will of the Edomites. After all, the Edomites were in power. All right, The, the wicked had sown root in the planet Earth. It tells you when Alexander the Greek, that's in the Apocrypha, when Alexander the Greek came on the scene, wickedness multiplied in the planet Earth. So that was the beginning of the Heavenly Father, Yahweh, the true God, sowing wickedness in the planet Earth. It began with the Greeks. That's why the so-called white man has a saying, civilization started with the Greeks. Yeah, the wicked civilization, civilization of wicked wickedness started with the Greeks. Let's prove that which the Greeks were Edomites. That was their true nationality, okay? As a matter of fact, that was a term, the Greeks, that was a term that they stole from the seed of Japheth. And that, that's another history to go into. Uh, let's go to... Is that, that's all Esau does. All he does is steal and lie and cheat and murder and kill. That's all he does, man. That's his legacy as the wicked. We're going to the book of uh, 1 Maccabees 1. Okay, 1 Maccabees 1 9, is it? All right. 1 Maccabees 1 and 9. Let's start at uh, the 7th verse. And, and so Alexander reigned 12 years and then died. And his servants bear rule everyone in his place. Those were the four generals that came up under him, one of them being Ptolemy. Okay? And after his death, they all put crowns upon themselves, like Ptolemy. Crown represent rulership. They had the power. So did their sons after them many years. Now here's the point. And evils were multiplied in the earth. You see that? So that was the beginning of the Heavenly Father sowing wickedness into the planet earth. And like Elder Apostle, um, Elder, I'm sorry, Elder uh, um, High Priest, Elder High Priest Yaikwab used to say, we had to learn wickedness in order to appreciate righteousness. That's why we're going through what we're going through. So so beginning with the Greeks, that was a time of the Heavenly Father Yahweh sowing wickedness into the planet Earth. That's why the Greeks took over. They had to fulfill prophecy. What prophecy? Let's read. You might ask, what prophecy? Well, let's go to Job, Job 9 and 24. When was the beginning of this, Job 9 and 24? Okay, the Greeks were indeed the wicked. Because we're going to go back to the Apocrypha and read that scripture again. Job 9 and 24, the earth is given into the hand of the wicked. So the, the question is, when did the wicked took over, totally took over the planet earth? Beginning with uh, that part of the region of the world. They hadn't taken over the Americas yet. That was to come. But when did the, when did the beginning of the wicked taking over the planet earth, when did that begin? With the Greeks. Okay, the earth is given into the hand of the wicked. He covereth the faces of the judges thereof. Right. Ptolemy the first put up that image and announced it to be a god, thereby covering the face of the true God. And we have that same image to this very day as in Jesus Christ. Now check that out, man. You can't make this shit up. The origin of Jesus Christ, so-called white man Jesus, that goes far beyond Caesar Bourget, which that's what we used to teach. Okay, that's the image of Caesar Bourget. It goes far beyond that. It goes all the way back to the fake God that told me the first created. And that we now have the facts, okay? The earth is given into the hand of the wicked. He covereth the faces of the judges there. There you go. That's why you that's how Serapis Christus came about, to cover the, the image of the true God. Alright? The faces of the judges there. If not where and who is he? There you go. So when did the wicked when did wickedness saturated the planet Earth? The beginning of it? Let's read again, 1 Maccabees 1 and 9. And after his death, the death of who? Alexander the Greek, or Alexander the Great. After his death, they all put crowns upon themselves, one of them being Ptolemy, who took over Egypt. So did their sons after them many years, and evils were multiplied in the earth because they're the wicked. The Edomites are the wicked. So now they were sown in power, beginning with the Greeks, all right, there's your seven heads and your ten horns of the, of, the, of the beast, in particular seven heads. The first head was the Greek or the Greeks. The second head was the Romans. 
the Romans came out of the Greeks. Okay? So there you go. So uh, going back to the information, right? See how everything is lining up? So now the key words in the above, pa above passage of no to note are Meyamun, Meyamun, Setepenre, or Setepenra, Sota, because these words are exactly the words that were used to create the fictitious character of Jesus Christ by wicked white Roman Emperor Constantine. Now they went off there. Constantine was not a so called white man, Constantine was a so called black man. He was a wicked Israelite, he was a sun worshiper. He wasn't a so-called white man, so they went off there, all right, by wicked white Roman Emperor Constantine, Emperor Constantine, which he was a so-called black man. At that time, so-called black men were ruling the papacy, all right. Uh, in 325, Anno Domi Domini, or Domino they have here, which, AD in the, which literally means in the year of our Lord, the first images of Ptolemy that are depicted as Jesus today were forced upon the Africans and were ordered to be worshipped by the people of Rome. Okay, now is there some truth to that? I do believe so. Okay, not just the Israelites that were worshipped, that the Israelites that were living in uh, Alexandria to be exact, but the Hamites that were living there also. All the peoples that were living there. They all had to bow down to this image that Ptolemy the first came up with. Okay, now here's the sec section, Serapis to Jesus. Ptolemy's rule wanted to create a deity that would be worshipped by both the black Egyptians and white Greeks. Okay, so you had the Israelites living in, around that uh, time in that, in that area, prefer uh, preferably Alexandria, city of Alexandria in Egypt. You had Edomites that were living there, because the Edomites were taking root there. All right. Then you had Israelites that were living there. You had Hamites that were living there. You had all these different nations that were living there. And Ptolemy the first wanted all of them to be his subjects through this fake god that he created. Check that out. He then created Serapis, the made up of Graco or Greco Egyptian god. See that? So he combined the philosophy of the Egyptians and their priesthood with the philosophy of the Greeks, which were Edomites. So really, in es in essentially, Serapis Christus was a Hamitic Edomite deity. A Hamitic Edomite deity. Check that out. He then created Serapis, the made-up... Uh, Greco-Egyptian god that was invented in the 3rd century BC. Thag is portrayed as a Greek in appearance. Now, um, the Edomites had other gods too, like Quaz. Quaz was another god that the Edomites worshipped. Okay, and I suspect that a lot of Israelites worshipped Quaz as well. Like El Apostol says, Quaz looked like a Barry Manilow, the singer Barry Manilow. Okay, reading on it says, Thag, I hope, I hope this word that's supposed to be there, is portrayed as a Greek in appearance, right? Hence the toga, going back to Serapis Christus, hence the toga and uh, the modius, which some call a flower pot that was on his head. The Egyptian uh, pharaohs, they also had a modius on top of their head because the modius goes back to the Greek the, the modius goes back to the god of agriculture the Egyptians they had a as a matter of fact let's go to Psalms 96 and 5 the Egyptians as in the real Egyptians the Hamites they were Hamites they had a god for everything they had a god for, for agriculture they had a god for the waters Dagon the fish god okay and, and that lines up with scripture Psalm 96 and five, let's read that. Psalm 96 and five. It says, for all the gods of the nations are idols. There you go. Like the Serapis Christus, that was nothing but an idol. Of what nation? The nation of Edom, the Edomites, because an Edomite came up with it. Patent it after the Egyptian uh, philosophy, which is hermetic, okay? For all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Right, 
And we, us Israelites, we know the one true God. His name is Yahweh. And he, it was he that made the heavens. Okay? Not Osiris or not Apis the bull, as the Egyptians worship. As a matter of fact, our forefather Abraham used to curse out. It tells you that in the Josephus. Any subject that the Egyptians went into, Abraham at that time, Abraham was who was living in Egypt, sojourned in Egypt, he used to curse out the Egyptians. And Abraham, uh, Abraham was known as Abram the Hebrew. He's the beginning of our forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. As Israelites, we have our forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, it tells you in the history that Abraham used to curse out the Egyptians. Because in their reasonings, they were totally stupid. And Abraham was the one that brought sense to the madness they were into. Okay? Anyway, read on. It says, Thag is portrayed as Greek in appearance, but with Egyptian accessories, or e e Egyptian accessories. Used in the mean of representing both wealth and resurrection. Yeah, and then do you know that there was a, a tenant, a doctrine actually created with the Serapis Christus? And it's the same doctrine, right? <laughs> it's the same doctrine that the wacky tacky Christian follows today. In other words, Serapis Christus was God and the Son of God at the same time. Does that sound familiar? Serapis Christus was born of a virgin. Does that sound familiar? All right? <laughs> so, let's read on. It says, Egypt, which you commended to me, my dear, my dearest Servanius, I have found to be wholly fickle and inconsistent. This was a letter written by Hadrian Caesar, was it? Around 134 AD. I believe that was the year for that. Hadrian Caesar to... Uh, to uh, Sylvanus or Sylvanius. Now, some say this letter has been forged. It's a forgery. That's what some say. But we get a clue from this letter here that Hadrian Caesar, after visiting that area where Serapis was prominent, Serapis worship was prominent, Hadrian Caesar wrote that letter to Sylvanius. Okay? And this is what he said. I have found to be wholly fickle and inconsistent and continually continually wafted about by every breath of fame. The worshippers of Serapis, all right, the God that hundreds of years ago, hundreds of years before, because this is around 134 AD. So if we go back, let's see, we go back hundred about almost 300 years before is when Serapis came on the scene, created by Ptolemy the first. So here's Adrian Caesar, right, which he was a Jake, right, saying to Sylvanius, the worshippers of Serapis here are called Christians. See that? Christians. Okay? So there's a big difference between the Christians and the anointed. All right? In the Hebrew, the, the term is Mashiach. The followers of Yahweh Shai were known as the anointed ones, Mashiachim. Okay? But the followers of Serapis Christus was called Christians. You see the confusion? Okay? So there have to be a distinction. All right? The worshippers of Serapis here are called Christians. Absolutely, they were called Christians. And those who are devoted to the god Serapis. I find calling themselves bishops of Christ. Bishops of Christ. Isn't that the title that uh, Nate has with his IUIC? The, the heads of that group, the IUIC group, they're called bishops, are they not? Bishop uh, Yawasap, Bishop Kenai, Bishop so-and-so, Bishop Nathaniel. Okay? And they're coming in, wait a minute, this group, IUIC, they're coming in the spirit of of Jesus Christ, are they not? God and Jesus Christ. What was their slogan? Most high and God Christ bless. So they're really bishops of Serapis Christus. IUIC is really bishops of Serapis Christus. All right, they worship, they know not what. Right? We know what we worship. We that's in the truth begin to follow the pastor. We worship Yahweh Bashim Yahshai. They worship God and Jesus Christ. Totally different spirit. 
I even showed you that with Google when I typed in Jesus Christ and then I typed in Yahweh Shai. Totally different spirits. <laughs> anyway, I find called themselves bishops of Christ, Hadrian to Silvanius, 134 AD. So now let's read about Constantine and Arius. Constantine the Greek, which was, he, he was an Israelite. He was a, 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 a Jake. In other words, he looked like a so-called black man. He did not look like a so-called white man. Constantine the Greek, and you had Israelites that called themselves Greeks, took on the custom of the Greeks. You'd have to go all the way back to the time of Maccabees. As a matter of fact, let, let me bring that to you. We go in the same book, 1 Maccabees, and we jump down to the 11th verse, 1 Maccabees, the first chapter. In the 11th verse, it says, In those days went out, went day out of Israel wicked men who persuaded many saying let us go and make a covenant with the heathen the heathen being the Greeks which were Edomites that are around about us and you better believe those Israelites worshipped Serapis Christus they had no problem worshipping that fake God that uh, Ptolemy the first had created that's why you read in the scriptures where it speaks about Israel when a whoring there's your example you had Israelites living at that time during the time of Ptolemy the first that had no problem making an alliance with the Greeks so that they could get a better life. That's one of the main reasons they did it. So this is what we're reading here. Let us go and make a covenant so it stands to reason they worship their gods, as in Serapis Christus. They, worship, they had no problem worshiping that fake god. Let us go and make a covenant with the heathen that are round about us. For since we departed from them, we have had much sorrow. Right, so they did it for a better life. So this device pleased them well. Then certain of the people, Israelites that was, were so forward herein that they went to the king who gave them license to do after the ordinance of the heathen. And you better believe uh, Antiochus, or also known as Antiochus, uh, when he took over later, around 160-something B.C., you better believe he pushed the same God that Ptolemy the first had created, Antiochus. Okay, or Antiochus. He pushed that worship. It's a rapist worship. So it says, Whereupon they built a place of exercise at Jerusalem according to the customs of the heathen. You see that? So they became like the Greeks. And this is, the, this is something that the wacky tacky Christian don't want to deal with. They always talk about the Gentiles and the Greeks. But here's the question. Did Israelites ever became like the Greeks? Did Israelites ever became like the Gentiles? Did the seed of Israel ever became like the Gentiles or the Greeks? The answer is yes. This is what the wacky tacky Christians don't want to deal with. You know why? Because it blows their argument out of the water that the Gentiles that the Bible speaks of is the actual nations that can receive salvation. The answer is no. The Gentiles that are going to receive salvation are the seed of Israel that was scattered among the Gentiles calling themselves Gentiles. And I'm reading to you an account right here. Here's Israelites calling themselves after the Greeks, worshiping their customs, dressing like them, worshiping their gods, etc., etc. Okay? They even made themselves what? Uncircumcised, which that's a law given to the Israelites, the law of circumcision, right? And made themselves uncircumcised and forsook the holy covenant given to the Israelites. Plenty of scriptures prove that and joined themselves to the heathen, as in the Greeks, and were sold to do mischief. Yeah, one of those things like worshiping the, the gods of the Greeks, such as Serapis Christus. So now, when you fast forward to 325 AD, it was the same thing. You had Israelites that continued those practices of worshiping the Greeks, okay, and the Romans, because later, before 325 AD, later came into rulership was the Romans. The Romans and the Greeks were the era of the Edomites ruling. Pretty much the uh, seven heads were the era of the of the uh, of the um, Edomites ruling. The same beast that the Apostle John saw on the island of Patmos, the beast with seven heads and ten horns, comprised as the Edomite rulership. That's what that is. Okay. So reading on, it says, uh, it says, uh, Roman Emperor Constantine the Great, Roman Empire from, Emperor from 306 to 337 AD, is known for being the first Roman Emperor 
to be converted to Christianity, which strangely enough, Arius of Libya, uh, 256 to 356 AD, born of African descent, he was a Hebrew Israelite, he was an Israelite, because the Israelites were scattered in those areas there, northern and west parts of Africa. After the diaspora, which took place in 70 AD, 67 AD, 70 AD, so this is almost 300 years, more than 300 years after the diaspora, what we're about to read here. You had this Arius character, no doubt he was a descendant of the Israelites, born of African descent, centuries after Ptolemy I, absolutely. Had a problem with the Roman Empire teaching the Africans and the people of Rome to worship a statue and celebrate in death. He was considered a heretic a professed believer of God who maintains religious opinions contrary to those accepted by his or her church, what the religious authorities usually controlled, what the religious authorities usually control by government deem as, as the truth, because he started attracting so many followers due to his teachings that were contrary to the Romans, Constantine called the council by summoning all the bishops to discredit Arius. The Council of Nicaea, during the time when th this meeting was called upon, there was no mention of Jesus Christ at all. No man had ever existed by the name Jesus Christ. And again, you, all you have to do is look at the title of uh, uh, the J, Jesus. That would not come about for, for a few more centuries. 1524 to be exact, the letter J by John George Orchesino. He's also known as the father of the letter J. So Jesus Christ didn't exist. Now what would have existed around that time was Iesus Christos in the Greek, also known as Serapis Christus. Okay? Uh, no man had, had ever existed by the name of Jesus Christ, and, and an important fact is that this all took place Anno Domini A.D., which Christians claim means after the death of Christ, but in Latin means in the year of our Lord. Absolutely, Anno Domini. The name Jesus Christ didn't exist before the meeting was called. Right. It was Iesus Christos, also Rappus Christus. Read the statements made during, the time, during that time frame. It was only after this that they presented to the people the name Jesus Christ. Well, it wouldn't have been the name of Jesus Christ. It would have been Iesus Christos or Serapis Christus. Because Jesus, the later J, didn't come about until 1524. What Lord are they referring to? Kings have always been referred to as lords or gods. If Jesus Christ didn't exist during the, during the time, this meeting took place, nor ever heard of whom our people worship him today. Let's read that again. What Lord are they referring to? Kings have always been referred to as lords or gods. If Jesus Christ didn't exist during the time this meeting took place, nor ever heard of whom our people worship him today, Serapis Christus. All right? Uh, Nisian uh, Creed. Jesus Christ is born. Nicene Creed, which became the statement of the Christian faith, was written and decreed, or decreed and sanctified by 318 Roman Catholic bishops at the council in 325 AD. Some believe this transformation took place Council of Cal Chalcedon, 451 AD. Okay. I want to read, I kind of want to sketch the highlights. All you have to do is read the Nicene Creed. Read the Nicene Creed. Came about 325 AD. The authorities shut down Arius, the authorities shut Arius down and threatened him with death to keep his mouth shut. They positioned the creed during that time when people started becoming aware of the lies and deception and ordered all books to be burned, destroying all ancient writings. No evidence, no argument. And the outcome was the transformation from Serapis Christus, which means Christ the Savior, to Jesus Christ, 
by edict of the Roman or the Emperor Constantine in 325 AD. So again, it wouldn't have been Jesus Christ, it would have been Jesus Christos or Serapis Christus, because the letter J didn't come about till 1524 AD. But according to this information, that's when Serapis Christus became what you know later today as Jesus Christ. Okay? And this is why the Apostle Paul, he talked about if someone come unto you, let's go to 2 Corinthians, the 11th chapter. 2 Corinthians, the 11th chapter, the, the first verse. Or the, is it the fourth verse? Yeah. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus. Now, would, it, would that have been Caesar Boger? No, because during the time the Apostle Paul read uh, or, write, or wrote that, Right? Caesar Bourget did not exist. That wouldn't come till centuries later. The, Bor the Borgia family wouldn't come till centuries later. A, a good almost 1,300 years, almost 1,400 years after that was written. So we have to be exact. So the only plausible answer would be Serapis Christus. Because Serapis Christus was also known as Jesus Christos, or Jesus Christ, another savior. Remember, Ptolemy the first created the Serapis Christus as an object of salvation to not only the Edomites that were living in Egypt at that time, but the Greeks, well, the Edomites were Greeks, or the Greeks were Edomites, rather, uh, not only them, but to the Hamites that were living in Egypt, that's what I wanted to say, to the Hamites that were living in Egypt at that time, living in the, in the city of Alexandria, and the Israelites that were living in in the city of Alexandria at that time, and all the other nations, okay? Ptolemy wanted this Jesus Christ to be worshipped, this Jesus Christos, this Serapis Christus. So the Apostle Paul, now during the time this was written, which had to be around what, 50 AD, 54 AD, somewhere around there, the letter that was written to the Israelites in Corinth, the Apostle Paul wanted them to know about that other fake Jesus Christ, Serapis Christus. That's what he's talking about. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, that's the Jesus that the wacky tacky Christian worships. That the average Christian church today, that's the Jesus they worship, which goes back to Serapis Christus. These are facts. Okay, that's the Savior, the imaginary Savior created by Ptolemy the First. That's what they worship, the wacky tacky Christian. We don't worship that. We worship the one true Savior, which is Yahweh Shai, our deliverer, our mediator, that the Heavenly Father Yahweh set up. That's who we worship. Okay? His name is Yahweh Shai. His Father's name is Yahweh. For if he that cometh, right, preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit, which you have not received, or another gospel, and remember, Serapis Christus had his own different spirit and his own gospel, if you can even call it that, which the word gospel means good news. You had tenets of the worship of Serapis Christus. One of them it was he was God and the Son of God at the same time. Another one was he was born of a virgin, which thereby made him a god. All right? All the same things that you hear, the same talking points you hear of the wacky tacky Christian concerning their Jesus Christ, which is actually Serapis Christus. For if you receive another spirit which you have not received, or another gospel, there you go, which you have not accepted, you might well bear with him. There you go. So he was definitely talking about Serapis Christus, Apostle Paul was. Would the Apostle Paul have known about Serapis Christus in his day? Absolutely. Let me ask that question one more time. Would the Apostle Paul have known about Serapis Christus in his day? Absolutely. Because that was smack dab in the, in the, it was, the Serapis Christus worship took off like a firestorm. You had a lot of Israelites worshiping that, that statuette, man. A lot of Israelites worshiping that statue. That image, just like today, you got a lot of Israelites worshiping so-called white man Jesus. Remember, in, the, in uh, the book of Ecclesiastes 1 and 9, it says there's no new thing under the sun. 
So now, let's keep reading. Let's keep reading. Uh, the authorities shut areas down and threatened him with death to keep his mouth shut. They positioned the creed during the time when people started becoming aware of the lies and deception and ordered all books to be burned, destroying all ancient writings, no evidence, no argument. And the outcome was the transformation from Serapis Christus, which means Christ the Savior, to Jesus Christ by the edict of Emperor Constantine in 325 AD. Again, Jesus Christ didn't come on the scene. The term Jesus Christ, did, that didn't come to way later. Constantine would have set up um, Jesus Christos. Jesus Christos or Serapis Christus. That's what he would have set up. That fake God. Uh, there many have been a man. They may, I'm done. I'm read. I read. I totally butchered that. There may have been, not may have been. There was. The scriptures tell us that. There may have been a man that walked the earth in the land known as Nazareth, that attempted to guide the people back to righteousness. What people? The Israelites, beginning with the elect. And that man, his name was Yahweh Shai. That's who we worship. But this man was not Jesus Christ. Or his name was not Jesus Christ. So is there some truth to that? <laughs> of course. Absolutely yes. His name was not Jesus Christ. You see how important it is to know the true name of the only begotten son? His name was Yahweh Shai. Okay? You see... No mention of any man in Nazareth named Jesus. Well, that's true because, again, letter J, didn't, there's so many things wrong with Jesus. Letter J, first of all, letter J, number one, letter J didn't come about till 1524. All right? Now, what the term that would have been there during the time our Lord walked the earth in Nazareth was Jesus. But that's in the Greek. But see, our Lord was not Greek. <laughs> Nor did he speak Greek. He spoke Hebrew. Our Lord spoke Hebrew. There was a saying among the Jews, it's better to eat pork than to speak Greek. That's how much they hated the Greek language. Okay? So check that out. Uh, you see no mention of any man in Nazareth named Jesus mentioned during the meetings in Rome. Or of a woman named Mary the Virgin giving birth to a child named Jesus. Okay? Now, did Mary exist? Absolutely. But her name would have been in the Hebrew. I believe it's Mara in the Hebrew. Okay? That's easy. We can look that up easy. And she was a virgin as in a young woman. She was married to, to Joseph. Joseph in the Hebrew is Yawasap. Yawasap. And she was married to Joseph. And they had their firstborn son, right, which was Yahweshai. Yahweh means he is the deliverer, he's the savior. He's the true savior, the true worshiper of the Heavenly Father Yahweh. Because Yahweh Shai worshiped the Heavenly Father Yahweh. Okay? This would explain why, there's, why there is so much emphasis put on Jesus Christ in the Bible, which further explains, well, the Jesus Christ of the Bible is not Serapis Christus. The Jesus Christ of the Bible is Yahweh Shai. It's just that they mistranslated the, the name in the King James Version. And that's where, thus, that's where all the confusion comes from. But to the elect, there is no confusion. That's why it, the Bible speaks about an elect. Okay? The, the wacky-tacky Christian, they're confused worshiping Jesus Christ. They're confused and they have no idea where the origin of Jesus Christ goes back to unless they watch this video. This would explain why there is so much emphasis put on Jesus Christ in the Bible, which further explains why God all of a sudden had to have a son. Son of God was turned into the son of God by Europeans. Again, um, Ptolemy the first came up, but what he did was he, um, well, number one, them being the wicked. Now, clearly it says in the scriptures, the Heavenly Father created good and evil. So the Heavenly Father put that reprobate spirit on them to create that. Told me the phrase, creating that fake God and son of God and all that nonsense. Now, is there a true son of God? Absolutely. The scriptures tell us that. His name is Yahweh Shai. Okay? But let's read this information here. 
Son of God was turned to the Son of God by Europeans. Again, they were not Europeans, they were Edomites. Which is why every picture of Jesus has <laughs> has the sun behind his head. Son Ra, son, son of Ra, God. Okay? And it looks like pretty much that's it. Okay? All of these images you see here is nothing but Serapis Christus minus the flower pot. That's all that is. Okay? That's all that is. Alright, so pretty much that's it. The main part of this information was Constantine. Uh, supposedly, according to this information, Constantine brought in the worship of Jesus Christ, which goes back to Serapis Christus, a.k.a. Jesus Christos. And that makes sense, because Constantine was a follower of the Greco-Roman way of things, even though he was an Israelite. He was a follower, and you had many Israelites that sold out to the Greeks slash Romans. We can read that account in, in Maccabees, so it makes sense. Constantine was not a righteous man. He was a wicked man. He was a sun worshiper. Okay? Those are documented facts. So once again, this Jesus Christ that the wacky tacky Christian worship is a fake God, man. And we know the origin of that fake God, so-called white man Jesus. Fake God. We worship Yahweh, Baal Shem, Yahweh Shai. Total difference. So hopefully you were edified by this lesson. If you was, drop a line in the comment section. I'll see you in the next one.